On January 27, 1970, Sheriff Billy Joe Dickens was murdered trying to stop a bank robbery in Houston, California. After one of the largest manhunts in Stanislaus County history, one of the robbers, Ross Neal Porter, lay dead, and the other, Leonard Ellsworth Miller, lay in the hospital recovering from wounds and under arrest. In this episode of California True Crime, we talk about the quest to hold Miller accountable, including a trial, a sanity hearing, and issues with the death penalty, and of course, California's ever-changing laws. Welcome to this episode of California True Crime. With me this episode are Charles and Sean. How are you two doing? Good. Really good. I'm good. In our last episode, we talked about the massive manhunt that went through several counties. It ended with Leonard Ellsworth Miller hurt but arrested, and Ross Neal Porter struck down when he didn't follow sheriff's directions. What comes next is the usual, a trial. And this would really seem to be a pretty straightforward case. After all, it's really clear who robbed the bank, but there are still some interesting uh, legal questions to answer before Miller can find out his fate. When we left off last episode, Sheriff Billy Joe Dickens was laid to rest in one of the biggest funerals ever to happen in Stanislaus County. His murder was a terrible event for his family and loved ones, but it also struck home for many of the families and officers throughout California, many of whom participated in tracking down Miller and Porter, and whose families worried that night for their well-being but also worried daily. This also affected the small community of Houston, California, and surrounding communities. This is a place where, as we talked about, information spread fast, and lots of people were fearful for their loved ones who might have been at the bank that day. This is also a community that works to take care of each other, so this event was unusual as well and left a lasting imprint on those who lived and worked there. Leonard Miller is in Scenic General Hospital in Modesto. He's recuperating from 14 different bullet wounds. During his stay in the hospital, he is cuffed, wearing steel shackles uh, to restrict his leg movement and under guard. This is a man who's escaped jail before, as we talked about, so they're keeping a really close watch on him. He's also in an area of the hospital called a security section, which I didn't know that the hospitals had or that this hospital had, which is essentially a green cell, that's how it's described, inside the hospital where he's under guard. Yeah, I didn't know they had anything like that, too. Maybe just because you watch movies and they just... They're like in a regular room, but uh, I didn't know they had something like this. I knew that some nurses at hospitals and stuff specialize in working with those kind of patients because, you know, um, having friends and family that have worked in the healthcare industry and and talking to them about when patients from like the county jail or like local prisons are brought through, there's sometimes special places and special staff that will help with those that are specifically trained for that. But kind of makes sense. By all accounts, he's making an incredible recovery. Just a few days after being shot, he's up and around in his room. He's walking. He's performing exercises. I mean, he was shot 14 times. So that's a really quick recovery. Everyone interviewed in the newspaper is also really surprised by how he's just kind of quickly healthy again. Just real quick so I can remember, is Miller, the the one that's in the hospital, is he the one that uh, shot and killed Billy Joe Dickens? Yes, he is. Okay. That's um, based on what the, his partner, Billy Joe Dickens' partner, said, Charles Moore, um, the description he gave as well as picking him out of a lineup. Miller will say different things. He'll, as we're going to go through, he'll kind of change his story, but he will blame Porter at one point. Um, but it is, this is who shot the officer. Miller also doesn't receive any visitors at the hospital, and that includes an attorney. Ross Neal Porter, on the other hand, was wounded in a shootout with police uh, and died after in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. He was the last robber for the police to find, and then he wouldn't do what they said. His body was taken to Salas Brothers Funeral Chapel in Modesto. This funeral home is right near Scenic Hospital, or what was Scenic Hospital in Modesto. It's at 419 Scenic Drive, and this whole area of Modesto and Scenic are, you know, funeral homes, um, headstone makers. There's also 
Uh, cemetery, actually. Yeah, cemeteries. Right, right down the street from both. Porter's family is in Oregon, including his living parents, his three brothers, three sisters, and his four children. They're notified of his death, and they choose to have him buried here in California. While they pay for a portion of his funeral, they don't have enough money to come to California to actually attend the service. The funeral costs included a $250 mortuary charge and a $202 burial fee. Some of Porter's Social Security and veterans' payments goes toward these fees, and Salas Brothers' funeral chapel takes care of the preparations for his funeral. On February 2, 1970, Porter was buried in Ceres Memorial Park. Ceres is a town between Houston and Modesto. His grave is there today, and it's about 30 yards away from Highway 99. He was buried at 11 a.m., and 10 people attended the funeral. They included two grave diggers, a reverend and Mrs. William D. Blankenship from the Pentecostal Church of God in Modesto, some mortuary employees, and two people in the area, a Mr. and Mrs. Earl Ruth. And these two people, according to Modesto B., often go to funerals of people they think won't have any family or friends there. They believe that no one should be alone when buried and, in fact, had attended actually another funeral that day where no one had come. A mortuary employee also read a short prayer. Interestingly, Porter's burial was supposed to be earlier in the day. Unfortunately, when they dug the hole for the place he was to be buried, they found another body there that they didn't expect, so they had to actually change where he was buried. Whoa, did that used to happen a lot? I don't know. I, I'm not really sure. I know that that cemetery has been there a very long time, so perhaps, you know, when it first started, there weren't as, the records weren't as well done as, you know, at this time period. But I just found it interesting. Yeah, it can, it can happen before in antiquity. It happened quite often, especially with pauper's graves or unmarked graves of uh, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. I mean, there's a whole episode we could do on the funeral practices of, of Western world. But that's why usually most cemeteries, especially in small, smaller communities, the funeral boards or the, or, or the group that control like or that will run the cemeteries have some of the re, the better records because they want to make sure that they're not burying people. And so but yeah. sometimes when a cemetery is built over or increased or changes hands, some of those records can be lost and, and changed. I know my like my hometown, um, the group has kept up the record since 1865. So there's actually a map that will tell where everyone is buried. And um, but even in that case, there's some there are some graves that are unmarked that have to be. And I think, you know, we have some experience with that in our family of making sure that you know we know that somebody's buried there, but we're not 100 percent sure who's buried there. So we make sure that that's not disturbed. Leonard Ellsworth Miller was arraigned in Modesto at the Stanislaus County Municipal Court on February 19, 1970. He is charged with 20 felony counts. It's safe to say that these are preliminary counts while they continue to kind of build a case. They include murder, kidnapping, robbery, car theft, and theft of a firearm. There is also the possibility looming that other charges are going to come from other counties. As many laws were broken as the two tried to escape, so they went through Calaveras County for, in particular. I think they had one of the shootouts there, so they're thinking about bringing charges against them or against Miller. Federal charges are also possible and up to the U.S. District Attorney in Sacramento. In the end, the, the murder charge that's coming will supersede any of the other felonies committed while evading police. And ultimately, the charge of murder can carry a possible death sentence, so if he's found guilty, it doesn't make a ton of sense for the federal government to spend the time and money having a trial for the robbery of the bank as well. So that in that case, were they thinking about having separate trials for those cases or instead of like charging him with murder and bank robbery and, you know, like discharging a firearm and evading police all in one thing? Like we've talked about in the past where where they're where they're categorizing everything that they're charged with and like ordering them and how they'll be charged. Or were they actually thinking about like we're going to charge you for murder in this county and then you're going to be charged in this other county and have a separate trial in like Calaveras County for evading police. The thing is, it's up to each of those people in the, those counties and those places. So Stanislaus County is definitely charging him with all of these things here. And I think the other people are kind of thinking, we'll wait till it, see how it shakes out. It doesn't really have too much in the research on their thinking or their process. Um, but obviously it costs money. And if someone is found guilty of, you know, and they're given the death penalty, you know, maybe going through the motions of charging them in a shootout, for instance, is really kind of unnecessary. There's also a five-year statute of limitation for the crime of robbing a bank. So they're really focusing on the, mur on the murder trial here and hoping that that is what he you know, is found guilty of. 
But that's always there too. A federal charge is a big deal if this doesn't go as planned. Well, and it's funny too, you bring up the cost of it. We've seen a lot of times, I think recently in a couple of cases, but then, and then I'm thinking of like going back to like the Dorothea Puente about how big a deal that is to move that whole trial to an entirely different county and then who has to foot the bill for that and all of the money. Well, they would be two separate trials. Right. No, I understand that. But even the, even the money associated with bringing a high profile case to trial can be enough that sometimes you might think like, well, if they're already doing it, why are we going to, you know, like, why are we going to take that financial burden on ourselves? The, the other question before you go on, though, is that five year statute of limitations still on the books for a bank robbery? I believe so. Yes. That is crazy to me that I could I could rob a bank. And then if I just evade capture for five years, I could get away with it. During the preliminary hearing in court, Miller is unshaven and his hands and feet are shackled as he shuffles in. He also has detectives guarding him. This seemed like a lot, but he led everyone on a big chase in the county and he's escaped from a courtroom before. So, On top of which, he's leapt out of a moving police car to evade capture after being arrested. Like, yeah, when he was on his way to Utah or whatever. Um, yeah, he got arrested and then he jumped out. Yeah, so I can 100%. I know, I know there's always that question about does, does how he appear uh, bias a jury, but A, there's no jury in this preliminary uh, hearing, and two, I would be terrified of having this guy not shackled and under armed guard because of his propensity to flee. And he's, well, I guess they don't know that, but he's made it pretty obvious that he does not want to go back to prison and does not want to be taken alive. He tells the court that he can't afford to hire an attorney and a public defender is appointed to him. The scuttlebutt at this time is that Miller has admitted to committing the robbery, but is refusing to admit he murdered Sheriff Dickens. He's saying that Porter was the one who committed that crime. And I'll just note here that, you know, there was a witness to that crime. Uh, Sheriff Moore identified Miller. I believe he also uh, participated early on in making a composite of what the person looked like. So he's very sure that this is the robber who committed that crime. Another hearing is set for later in February, and he's taken to Dual Vocational Institute in Tracy, California. This is a state prison, and most often you'll see it referred to as DVI. This is where he'll stay during the trial, and it's also where he's interviewed by the FBI. Presumably, they have a lot of questions about other crimes and even other associates and connections to other criminals. I'll note here that during this time, while he's under arrest, he not only converses with officers who are monitoring him, But he's also interviewed, as I said, by the FBI, and it sounds like several other investigators. These will come back, and we'll talk about those interviews more during trial, but he doesn't really see his public defender until late in the game. So these conversations are allowed because he's waived his right to stay silent. And the information gained from these interviews, while we don't have all of the information, paints a picture of a man who's lying and kind of constantly changing his story. And we'll go through that as we talk more about this. These other investigators are investigating him for his other potential robberies that he's committed or specifically just around this one case? I think all of that, yeah. As we've seen in other cases, when the prosecutor wants to have a strong case moving forward into trial, a grand jury is convened. If an indictment is secured in the grand jury, they can also forgo other preliminary hearings. There are at least 18 witnesses who testify during this grand jury. It's also important to know that the murder weapon, the specific gun that killed Sheriff Dickens, is never located. And I mean, they were around a lot of different places that day, so they could have put it anywhere. Other weapons are found, but not that specific weapon. Some of the charges include murder and attempted murder, 17 charges of kidnapping, one count grand theft of a gun, and one count auto theft. The 17 charges of kidnapping, that would be putting the bank people, both employees and customers, in the vault, correct? Yeah, taking them hostage, okay. yeah. One of the most important witnesses is Sheriff Dickens' partner, Sheriff Charles Moore. He witnessed his partner's death and saw who shot him as well as experienced his own attempted murder. They also called witnesses like Boucher, who, if you remember, helped his friend purchase the getaway car. Miller did not testify during this proceeding, and the grand jury voted to convict and charges were brought against Miller for the murder of Sheriff Dickens. While this is all going, there are changes being made because of this crime. A criminal justice committee is convened and takes a look at the crime, and in particular the procedure that plainclothes sheriffs carry the small snub-nosed revolver. So if you remember, Sheriff Moore and Sheriff Dickens carried a much smaller gun. They were um, detectives at the time. They weren't weren't typically out on patrol, so they weren't expected to, to carry larger weapons. 
They make a recommendation to change that procedure and allow play close sheriffs and detectives to carry a faster, more accurate weapon. The main idea is that if these detectives are expected to answer to crimes like the Houston robbery, then they should be able to carry something to defend themselves. They're mainly giving up the ability to carry that lighter, smaller weapon, but in this case, it makes a lot of sense. Miller is arraigned on the new charges the grand jury looked at. He is brought to court in white coveralls and stood quietly. His attorney tells the court that keeping Miller at dual vocational facility in Tracy is a big problem and providing a deprivation of counsel. This is actually a pretty big jaunt for an attorney who has other cases, I think would think especially kind of a public defender, and he hasn't been able to even talk with his client. This arraignment took place on February 17th, so he's been in jail, Miller has for some time, and not spoken at all with his attorney. The public defender given to Miller is a man named Walter C. Hancock, who, according to the MSOB, was the first public defender in Stanislaus County in 1955. I don't know the reason he's being held at a prison instead of when we've done a lot of cases, we find that people awaiting trial are held you know, closer at j- in jails. Maybe it's because he's escaped before or he's dangerous. Um, but that is about, a, on a good day, a 30-minute drive to get to Tracy from Modesto. So I can see how the public defender would have difficulty getting to talk with his client as much as that person needs to. On April 6, 1970, the trial got underway. The district attorney in the trial is Alexander M. Wolf, and the judge is William Zeff. Miller had two pleas to the charges. He pleaded not guilty, and in the second plea, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. What this meant was that for the purposes of the trial, he was saying that he wasn't guilty of the crime. But if at the end of the trial, the jury were to find him guilty, then a second trial would occur to determine if he was sane. If he was found sane during that second trial, then a third trial would be held to determine if he would receive the death penalty or life in prison. Receiving the death penalty would at this time mean, according to the Modesto B, the gas chamber. The same jury is supposed to serve in all three phases. So it wouldn't ma- So it w- it's not like we're, we're saying at the end of that, if he's found guilty... We go to a new trial. It's the same judge, the same jury, the same everything. Yeah. The same people will have to determine whether he's insane or not. Right. The legal question changes. The legal question, yeah. but not the group. That's interesting. Correct. Yeah. And then, then the same group would then say, well, now we found you insane. Is the death penalty uh, justified or is it life in prison? Sane. If they find him insane, then he'll go to a hospital. And, and, and if, he, if he wasn't, then it's the death penalty. Right. And that's not that's predicated by the law and the severity of of the charges. It's not that the jury has a say in how the what the punishment dished out, whether it's life or or death penalty. That's on the prosecution side. No, in the third trial, if he were to, so, if he's found guilty and then he's found sane, the third trial is for the jury to decide whether he gets the death penalty or, or whether he gets in, life in prison. Oh, okay. I won't go over every aspect of this trial, but there are a few legal questions and interesting things that happen, so we're going to cover those. As I said, one would think this would be a pretty straightforward case, but there are actually a lot of intricate legal questions. One of the first big legal decisions is whether or not there should be a change of venue. This trial is held in Modesto, but this decision will have big implications on appeals and actually huge implications for Stanislaus County moving forward. And we've talked about the pros and cons of moving a trial to another venue, um, cost, uh, you have to weigh someone's right to a fair trial against, you know, the cost of moving that trial. So the biggest issue in this case is the intense coverage of the case and whether that stacked the deck against the defendant and his right to a fair trial. The judge decides the trial will not be moved and it's held in Modesto. And just to clarify, this was heavily covered by the Modesto B, not just the details of the crime. I mean, that's where I got most of these details but also details about the victim, details about the funeral. So I don't know what you guys think about this decision. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a kind of fair one. A, it's, yeah, it was, it was really greatly covered by the Modesto B, but at the time, and if you're not familiar with like Central Valley newspapers, which you may not be, but some of, some of you, especially if you're listening to this in California, you know, there's a Sacramento B, the Fresno B, and the Modesto B. They're big newspapers. You know, even in 2021, where a lot of that coverage has been offloaded to uh, writers that don't necessarily, we don't have, maybe the, they don't have the biggest staff, you know, the Modesto B is still a pretty large newspaper. So I think it would be hard pressed to move that trial anywhere where that paper wouldn't have touched. You'd have to move it a lot farther than maybe they were comfortable with. 
like Southern California or something like that? Yeah, maybe we're like closer to the Bay Area, okay. you know, because I, I think at least my understanding of it is the, the B was, you know, you have all of Stanislaus County it pulls from, but then I there's also that bleed over with our counties around it where they're still reporting on it. So I also think that with as big as this case was at the time, and it being covered by a major newspaper, those stories are picked up a lot by the AP and then printed in other newspapers as well. So really, where would you move this to, to be completely? I I'm not, wouldn't worry about the jury pool so much, but since it was a police officer that was killed, I would worry more about the actual legal system in favoring oh, that's a uh, good point. The, the outcome. That there might be an implicit bias because a police officer was killed and you're a police officer from the county. So that the, the legal system itself, the bureaucracy, the prosecutor, the judges, those might be leaning in to go after this person because they killed the police officer. Right. Well, and lots of people also participated in searching for them. You know, so there's yeah, that like adds like the connections how, kind of to, I would think, a jury pool. How many other different police agencies plus the call out and then you have different crimes in different counties. But it's they keep it in Modesto. During the trial, there are many, many witnesses. Uh, Charles Moore, Dickens' partner, also again, a major witness. The bank employees, the citizens of Houston who witnessed the shootout. Other deputies from Stanislaus County, uh, San Joaquin County and Calaveras counties. They're all part of the shootout and hunt, so they testify. Investigators who looked into the crime and who also processed uh, the various crime scenes, of which there are really like four different places, the bank, where they left the car, uh, Altaville, and then where Miller was arrested and Porter was killed. In all, there are over 200 pieces of evidence submitted that include bloodstained clothing, guns, expended bullet shells, bloodstained money bags, packs of stolen money, photographs, Fragments of car seat covers, nylon stocking masks, first aid materials, just a whole bunch of stuff. One of the first legal questions is regarding a quick conversation, or rather words that were had between Miller and the officer who first comes into contact with him after he surrenders. If you remember, this happened after a shootout when Miller had been hurt and is in a gully, and he tells the officers that he's ready to give up. At that moment, it's about 1 a.m., it's still dark, Porter is still on the loose, and the officers tell him to crawl out. It takes him a few minutes and a refusal before he does so. But as soon as he does, they call to get help, you know, call an ambulance because he's been shot. In the first few moments after he comes out, the officers are still on high alert for Porter. They also have to assess Miller's wounds. Miller had said that he couldn't use his arm, so the officer just quickly asks him, what's wrong with your arm? And Miller replies that he was shot during the robbery. That conversation happens before Miller is officially under arrest and his rights haven't been read to him, including the suggestion that he can remain silent. So Miller's lawyer argues that this means that conversation cannot be admitted into testimony. And this would seem like a small detail, you know, in the midst of all of this evidence, but Miller has changed his story multiple times. So it's important for the prosecution to, to get whatever information that, you know, fits what they believe happened into the courtroom. After he's been arrested, he will tell police that he wasn't at the robbery at all. Uh, he'll change his story and say that he was at the robbery, but wasn't there for the murder. Um, so it's just kind of important to nail down specifically what happened. And Miller, you know, this, this conversation does that. The DA says that this conversation happened while well in the midst of an emergency situation, and the deputies didn't have time to read Miller his rights. They also weren't really technically, in, you know, they didn't ask him specifically about a robbery. They weren't trying to trick him or anything, just trying to actually get him help. So this information was offered up on his own. I don't know, what do you guys think? Should this be allowed in the courtroom? I do, considering the fact that that, the reason why he was in the situation to begin with is because he, they stopped, pointed their guns at police officers, and were making kind of a final stand in the middle of a road. So it's not like these cops that were, were assessing the emergency situation didn't actually witness Miller shooting at them. They returned fire, and then he ended up in the gully. It's not like they were just driving down the street and said, oh, here's a guy in a gully, let's stop, and then I'm assessing a situation. I think it is an emergency situation that they were trying to ascertain but it's in the process of arresting him i think which should totally be allowed i don't know the full law and i think using the term emergency situation is a slippery slope for future if you said that for everything uh, it seems like everything's an emergency situation the right right when you pull someone over 
you're putting yourself in an emergency situation. I don't know mm-hmm. if you know, do you understand where I'm going with yeah. that. So I don't know, but at the same time, I don't know. That's I, just the hard part. Uh, yeah, but it's I like think... I I just think with those kind of things where it's like, oh, we put it here, then people can come back to this and say it's an emergency situation. How far does it go? Right. It's a it's a it could be set as a precedent. I, I think, you know, the fact that it was witnessed, it wasn't because I there would be to me there'd be a bigger gray area if the police had had been had seen the car pulled over and then called out as they were walking up. But th- in this case they saw the people, uh, Miller and Porter, you know, stop, get out of the car, fire at the police. They returned fire. One went into the gully. The other took off. Uh, it's a little bit different than calling any situation an emergency situation. I think as a judge, you would have to make the decision already right. knowing the other evidence where right. they pretty much have <laughs> a daily planner of theirs that says rob this bank today. Right. So I don't know if they technically need it to get into legal situations so but there's but I, but you do bring up that point of it's always a good idea to think about what precedent this will set for future cases and and how much a police officer would be able to use and just say well i didn't read them the miranda rights because i believed it was a, an emergency situation without a clear understanding of well let's define that then mm-hmm. then what's the low end and the high end you know in this case i look at this as a high end like these two people were shooting at us Oh, that's definitely an emergency. Right. Me pulling over, you know, or me pulling over off the side of the road and I saw a car and, and I yelled out to somebody. I don't know that. I don't necessarily, that might to me low end. I don't know that's an emergency walking up to it. The judge agrees with Hancock, the public defender, and decides that this conversation can't be admitted as evidence. I will say that the conversation about the conversation itself never happens in front of the jury because we've, we've seen that before. Mm-hmm. Um, the objection happens before the officer testified. So. Another legal issue arises when the DA asks a question of one of the deputies about Porter. The judge has to determine how much information about Porter is to be allowed in court, since Porter, I mean, is technically not on trial here. He's a huge part of this, and he is deceased, but, you know, this trial is about Miller and his guilt. The judge decides that none of the evidence about Porter that deals with the, his flight or the pursuit of him can be entered into evidence unless it specifically affects one of the specific charges against Miller or the conspiracy to rob a bank charges. As an example, some of the money that's taken during the Houston robbery was found on Porter, and that's entered into evidence because it pertains to both of them. But other things that are specifically just about Porter and don't involve Miller have to be left out. I just found that really interesting. Yeah, I think the judge seems to be playing a fair... I mean, he's keeping it in the the county, but yeah. he seems to be looking at it and... And being making it as fair of a trial as he can. Yeah, I understand why they would do that. It does make it difficult because then how do you parcel out some of that to determine if does is this specifically for the crime that involves them both, or is this a evidence that he's a bad person to begin with? The defense also objects to a second conversation that happens a few days after Miller is in custody. Miller starts talking with the Stansaw Sheriff Sergeant. And during that discussion, Miller, he kind of just unloads a few things that he's thinking. He says that Dickens wouldn't have been murdered if he'd had a more accurate, more powerful weapon. And the reason that's important isn't because it makes all that much sense. But as we know, Sheriff Dickens was shot in the back. But it indicates that Miller is saying it's not his fault, mainly not because he didn't shoot him, but because Sheriff Dickens didn't have a bigger weapon. Oh, so Miller's saying had the, had the police officer, Officer Dickens, had a better gun he probably would have killed me before I killed him kind of thing. Yeah, I'm not really sure what his logic is here. The importance of entering this conversation, though, into the courtroom is... He's admitting that he actually... So this is another instance, and we've seen it. I mean, just recently when we talked about the Gwen Rejo case and Michael Madsen just not refusing to be quiet when he's already had his rights read. This seems like it's another version of that of, you just need to be quiet if you're arrested. Yeah, the problem is that during these conversations, and he's going to say a couple other things I'll say here to the sergeant, he wasn't reminded of his rights to say, you know, that he could stay silent. And so the public defender is saying this should not be allowed in the courtroom, even though Miller is kind of basically admitting to some of these things. Is there a time period that you need to be reminded of your rights? I had never heard of that before. I but either. So like every time somebody from the other side talks to you, then is that like a... Like a different person maybe? Yeah, like I have to remind you that... That's interesting. Yeah, we should look that up. 
Yeah, this is interesting. I, I'm with you, uh, Sean. I don't think we really know how that turns out in a legal sense. So if you're listening to this and you do know uh, how often a suspect needs to be reminded of their rights after the initial time that they were, their rights were read in California, uh, please contact us at calitruecrime at gmail.com or uh, any of our social media or our, our Facebook discussion groups, Cali True Crime. He also tells uh, the sergeant that Dickens wouldn't have been murdered if a third person had been there at the robbery as a lookout with a high-powered rifle. Uh, He also says that he could have chosen to take Dickens hostage instead of shooting him. Miller told the sergeant that there was supposed to be a third person there during the robbery, but that they, quote, weaseled out at the last minute. He also denied shooting Dickens in the back, stating that he shot him as he was turning around. So, just to get this squared away... What is the basis that they want this thrown out? That, that the sergeant, while he's telling him this, didn't remind him that he had the right to remain silent. Okay. So that idea of, of Miller, let's suppose, a few days later in a holding cell somewhere, the sergeant is watching Miller, and Miller starts in on like, man, you know what? Dickens wouldn't have been dead if he had had a better gun. Or Dickens wouldn't have been dead if that third guy had shown up like he should have then that sergeant should have stopped him right there and said, before you say anything, remember, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used. Right. There aren't details about how this conversation started, so I don't know. The sergeant could have asked him a question. I have no idea. It doesn't matter. It's just the idea. Well, I mean, like, it does matter. But in this case, it doesn't matter because the initial point, like you brought up, Sean, is that he's being, the what's being argued is that he was not reminded uh, of his uh, Miranda rights. Yeah. I think, if anything, hypothetically, if the sheriff sergeant asked a question first, any question, could that be? Yeah, that's a good. That would be a good point to find out. Is that whether whether it's Miller sitting there going, "Well, you know," right, or is it, "Hey, do you want a blanket?" It could be anything to start a conversation. Right, right, right. Which right. could be like deceitful. Or yeah, or at least, or at least there would it would it would color it enough to say, well, were you trying to, mm-hmm. tr- like you said, were you trying to make a connection to to answer questions, or were you really simply just asking him, do you want a blanket? Right. It was interesting to me because we've seen some cases where it really seemed incumbent upon the person about who had committed the crime or who had been arrested for the crime to, to stay silent, and not so much up to police to keep reminding them. This is sort of the opposite. The judge does not allow this conversation in court because he wasn't reminded that any statements he made could be held against him in a court of law. Well, and, and going back to something that we always talk about, too, a lot when we talk about things like Dateline or 40, Next 48 Hours or, or Forensic Files, or when we watch those recorded uh, confessions or those recorded interrogations, right? And a lot of times you see them, hey, you, know, you have the right to remain silent, and then they start asking them a bunch of questions after that. I still go back to what you asked earlier, Sean, of... At what point do I have to remind them? Oh, wait, got to remind you, got to remain silent. Well, it's hard without knowing the exact situation. You know, Mm -hmm. if the sergeant initiated a conversation or if Miller just walked up and starts telling him stuff, you know, those two things are really different to me. But, um, and, and does that matter then? Do, if you start talking as the, as the suspect, do then I have a responsibility? as the, the officer of the court to then say, you're still under oath, I have to warn you, before you have a chat. One of the more difficult pieces of testimony had to be a nurse who testified to Deputy Billy Joe Dickens's last moments. Evidence, including his clothing, was entered into testimony, and it's a reminder that even though so much has happened, there really is a real victim here, and it had to be difficult for friends and family to hear. Aside from this, there was also a bit of levity in the trial when a man named Norval Long testified that a couple days after the robbery, he found one of the spent bullets outside a home on Charles Avenue. That's just outside the bank in Houston. Apparently, Long had a trained monkey and had taken him for a walk. During that walk, the monkey pulled on its leash and then hit the ground a few times with its hands and picked up something off the ground and put it in its mouth. Long took the atom away from the monkey and it turned out to be a bullet. Apparently, the bullet had uh, hit the roof of a home on Charles Avenue, slid off of it onto the ground below, and the bullet is given to deputies at evidence. And aside from this being just really surprising when I was researching this, that there was a monkey in Houston, um, and this, you know, got laughs in the courtroom because of just how odd it was, it does bring up a kind of odd thing. Like, what do you do with evidence that's found by an animal? Yeah, you know, I, and 
like what's the chain of custody in that of and and honestly the the image there's a lot to unpack in this the image of some guy mr long walking down the street with his trained monkey on a leash is hilarious but th- this got there has to be more more instances of either people with pets or people themselves picking up evidence and then turning it into police and how is that is that is that the same level of evidence obviously i can't believe it would be as something that's collected on the day of from the the actual police back to your point though i feel like sometimes evidence that isn't found on the first day is still a huge piece i mean look at uh, manson the mm-hmm. the wallet in the toilet, the gun on the side of the hill. That was weeks or months later for the wallet. And those were huge pieces of evidence. Right. But I'll counter that with, you know, a case that we covered with Ketty. You know, think about the, the um, on both sides of the fence, though, really. But think about the hammer and the knife. You know, the, but I don't believe, I think last time we looked into that, like that stuff wasn't really tied. Right. But it, but, but the moment it brought every, it br- was brought up. Now, that's a, I think the Keddie's a little different because it was so many years later. You know, uh, in your, your examples, that was relatively soon after the crimes. And I don't know. And then, and then it, I think that then falls on the, your defense attorneys, right? I mean, if you, Unfortunately, if you have money to to spend on a better defense attorney, can you poke mo- more holes in a spent bullet uh, found by a monkey? You know, and I mean, it's just one of over two hundred pieces of of evidence. So yeah, you know, but it it was interesting to me for sure. It's time to feel the rage. Join us on Film Rage, where we talk movies, current releases, coming attractions, streaming, and classic films as well. Directors and actors, beware as you cannot hide from the rage. My name is Bryce, and I'm part of the Film Rage crew, which also includes Jim. Hey, hey. And Murray. Yo. Why is it you always talk? All the time. I can't understand why you this, 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 this is the Merman, the voice of reason. I These two can't awesome. agree on anything most of the time. You some you movies are Mondo, some are just suck. Every week, something is going to make us rage. Join us every Wednesday and feel the rage. During the entirety of the trial, Miller was very quiet as he sat next to his attorney. He did have a single outburst when a hardware salesman from Modesto was testifying. This witness said that Miller purchased a five-gallon gas can from him, and Miller yelled out, quote, you're a liar. The judge warned him to control himself, but that was really the only thing I could find was like something he did during trial. I'm not sure why that specifically. I don't know if that's like genius or not, but like maybe this guy was a liar and he was calling him out that he didn't buy. Maybe, but who knows? Maybe he bought a two gallon gas tank. Well, you did. They did find a, a, a gas can in the back of the tr- car, correct? Right, because they were going to burn the car, yeah, and they had they stole the sheriff's car. So it could have been maybe that kid wasn't the, or I say kid, but that person wasn't the person he bought it from, and maybe that was one indication that everything else they're saying is true. Or maybe it was the other guy that bought it. Right, 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 and they were they're both there at the same time, and they recognized. So them. I think it's interesting. It could be good to call him a liar, but at the same time, you calling this one guy a liar, but not calling out anyone else right. of the witnesses yeah. makes you look bad. So, I mean, it's probably better, like we've always said, keep your mouth shut no matter what time. The prosecutor put forth lots of witnesses and lots of evidence. When it was the defense's turn, they rested without offering a single witness, and Miller didn't testify. Yeah, that sounds weird. Like, there's no, they didn't bring any other evidence? Yeah, I don't, I, it was a surprise to me. Uh, Personally, I don't know who they would have put on the stand in defense of Miller, but it still shocked me a little bit that they didn't, they just kind of rested. There were no witnesses on their end. I guess I think it too, it goes down to like, he's not questioning that he did. I mean, they have a ton of evidence, but really when you get down to it, with the exception of one eyewitness, which again, it's it's, with the exception of one eyewitness and it's a good eyewitness. I mean, it's, it's the officer that was there. There is no, what other direct evidence do they have that Miller was the one to shoot the fatal bullet? Unless they're just fully banking on the next phase of insanity. Yeah, like they're saying, you know, we're going to throw a dice that no sane man would do this. But yeah, even that, like, again, with all the evidence and everything else that's been, been shown, 
it just seems hard for me to believe that a jury would believe that an insane person would go to that much detail in planning. Closing arguments were also an example of contradictions. The prosecutor's closing argument lasted an entire day and a half. The public defender's argument lasted 10 minutes. Hancock, the public defender, said, quote, take the evidence and the law and do what you think in your conscience is right. He also asked the jury to pay attention to the judge's direction when it came to second-degree murder. And I'm assuming that this meant he really wanted them to think about, you know, Miller had done this, but it's not a first-degree charge. So meaning that, that Miller didn't start the day with planning and forethought to, to murder Deputy Sheriff Dickens. So, right. that, so that then it has to be like the, the second degree then. Right. I mean, it wasn't premeditated. There are other mitigating factors like robbery right. here, which increase those crimes as we've talked about before. So it's just probably his way of kind of communicating to the jury. That's an, that's an interesting tactic because I would think that the, just the fact that they were in a gunfight with the two officers means that you planned on killing them. The jury was made up of five men, seven women, and two women alternates. On April 20th, 1970, they received the case and began deliberation. Before doing so, they had lunch at the Hotel Covel on 1023 J Street. It was on the corner of 11th and J Street, Modesto, and when it opened in 1924, it was a pretty big deal among hotels in California, I guess. I actually never heard of this place, even though we've all spent tons of time in Modesto. I just know that it turned into, before it was torn down, a very, very scary place. Uh, This hotel also boasted a private bath in every room when it opened. Um, It was a pretty big deal. A movie was shot in Modesto called Dodge City, and I guess people like Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland stayed there. In the 1990s, as Sean said, it was torn down so that this area could be redeveloped. The jury was escorted to the hotel dining room by armed guards. Afterwards, they deliberated for five hours. This may not sound like very much time. I know to me at first it really didn't sound like a lot of time, but it does seem the jury did its due diligence. Twice they had to go back into the courtroom, the first time to reread the testimony of Charles Moore. That took about two hours for them to do. The second time they asked to reread the judge's instructions on theft of a weapon while armed with a deadly weapon. So they're taking seriously even the less, you know, less serious charges as well. Well, too, I, I think that's, speaking of that charge specifically, that speaks to the larger charge, though, too. If they really are parceling out whether it is whether he murdered Officer Dickens, is if it's first degree or second degree, and if they're parceling that out, then, you know, part of that is them stealing another weapon. I think that would, that would go into that. After five hours, they find Miller guilty on all the charges, including first degree murder. Now that a guilty verdict has been decided by the jury, the next step is in the trial to determine if Miller was insane at the time of the crime. If you remember when we talked about this before, the basic legal question is, does Miller understand the nature of his act, and does he understand the difference between right and wrong? Basically, would you have committed the crime if a police person was standing right there? At stake for Miller is the death penalty, or life imprisonment. To prove that Miller was sane, the DA put two psychiatrists on the stand, One was a Dr. Max Brannon from Merced, and the other a Dr. Warner Selling from Modesto. They separately interviewed Miller for two hours each, and told the court that after those exams, they believed Miller was sane. According to them, he, quote, understood the nature and quality of the acts during the robbery. They also believed he understood not only the consequences when he made the choice to rob the bank, take hostages, murder Sheriff Deputy Dickens, but that he actively disagreed with society's viewpoint of those crimes. Basically, he understood that society and the law would oppose those actions, but he chose to do them anyway, and he didn't think that they were so bad himself. Miller's lawyer did object to the testimony being delivered by the psychiatrist, stating that the two-hour interview for each was not enough time to decide that Miller was sane. The judge disagreed and overruled the motion. It's an interesting tact because the burden is on the defendant to prove he was insane, and of course the prosecutor, prosecutors will work to contradict that, but it isn't really their job to prove or disprove sanity. Uh, to prove that Miller was insane, the defense offered a psychological evaluation that was created by the Oregon State Penitentiary while Miller was there. That's the prison he had just been released from when he came to California. That report didn't say that Miller was insane, but it did talk about his personality traits. In the Modesto B, it's reported that it said Miller had a, quote, psychopathic personality with antisocial reactions, hypomania trends, and was dangerously assaultive, impulsive, and suffered from inadequate judgment. Miller was prone to erratic behavior that often led to verbally abusive encounters. He could be stubborn, 
cold-blooded with others, arrogant, suffering from explosive blow-ups, and resentful of controls. Miller did not testify on his behalf during this hearing, but he does begin something we talked about in episode two that he did in other trials and hearings in other states. He begins to kind of try to take control of his own defense. And it appears that this is because he and his lawyer disagree on certain motions or how to present his defense, which this is the one part I can actually understand. Miller, not his lawyer, motions and asks the judge to postpone the sanity trial. According to Miller, he's been in communication with a private investigator in Fresno, California, who was willing to track down more information for Miller to help prove that he is insane. Miller believes perhaps a file exists somewhere that would include more information for his treatment while in prison. Miller had spent over 26 years of his life in prison, and specifically during his time in the Oregon Penitentiary, he said he spent five years in isolation and in conditions so bad that many inmates committed suicide. He also said he underwent a severe beating that left him with a brain concussion. Miller's attorney tells the court that he doesn't understand what information this investigator could find or what could be left after he had looked for things. Um, the judge denies the motion and to extend the sanity hearing. That's interesting because I think that defense in 2021 may have actually held more water given what we know of the detrimental effect that isolation has as, aside from the fact of the, the beating in CCE. Yeah, I think it's hard because Miller's a liar. So yeah. I'm not, obviously prisons are terrible places. Also, he committed a lot of crimes before he entered Oregon Penitentiary. Right. So I don't know what, why that would explain this, but not the other ones, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But he, he's constantly lying. So I'm not saying those things didn't happen. I have obviously being in. Did he actually have the detective? <clears throat> I don't even know if that, yeah. See, it goes back to the, what you stated previously too the idea that he we all know he's manipulative he's smart he's manipulative like a lot of the people that we've talked about that commit these kind of crimes they're playing on trying to play on the sympathies of others a lot of times but he has had a hard life you know i mean that's undeniable he he was at a terrible reform school and but quite a few of those people place you know so quite a few of those people that went through there don't go on to do you know, shootouts in public and shoot police officers. True, yeah. During closing arguments, D.A. Wolf remarked on whether Miller was insane and the legal question at hand. Quote, Our prisons are full of people who know society would not approve of their actions, but they do it anyway. Basically, Miller may have had a hard life, may have suffered in jail, but none of this changes that he was sane at the time of the crime, as sane as anyone who has committed any crime. Hancock took a different tactic, saying, quote, In my estimation, anyone who has spent that much time in prison and who, knowing the consequences, still goes into a bank and attempts to rob it in the middle of the afternoon must be insane. The jury deliberated for one and a half hours with a two-hour lunch and decided that Miller was sane. Now that Miller has been found guilty and sane, it next moved to the penalty phase. This trial opened with Miller, not his lawyer, once again penalty phase that was denied. During the A lot of the stuff Miller has been accused of or or convicted. He shot in Utah. Ralph Watson will come and testify. The officer who he kidnapped, Lawrence Kazar, also testified. And an officer who was there when he escaped custody in Oregon comes and testifies. So this was to prove a long history of criminality. That must be crazy for the jury who have just sat through all this, know this crazy crime. And then the third phase, oh, Here's a cop that he shot. Here's a cop that he kidnapped. And here's a cop that he jumped out of his car from. It's just everything to hear going Uh, both ways. Like the, the, um, the episode on juvenile justice, mm -hmm. these mitigating circumstances that weren't allowed before to come in for a penalty phase is just as important. I feel as the other way. Can you, I mean, on a lighter note, I can imagine sitting in the, in the jury and go, who sure glad we voted the way we did. Right, yeah. You know. Miller also testified on his own behalf. This was against his lawyer's advice and is the first time he will testify. During his testimony, he talked about a third person who was involved in the crime. He said this man was from Roseville, but refused to give any specific information about him. So what would be the point of bringing him up now? I imagine he's trying to put guilt onto... You know, he tries to put guilt on Porter initially, and now it's to put it on another person. I'm not really sure that it doubt. makes all that much sense. Yeah, so but no death penalty. Yeah, okay. Miller has mentioned another man before, but Miller is also not, as I said, a reliable source. He tells many different stories. 
he told, like we said, he told one officer that he wasn't there at all. He told another that he was there, but he never went into the bank. Uh, he told others about the, you know, that he specifically about the murder of Dickens. But what I find interesting is that he said this other man was with him and Porter during other crimes they committed. You know, we know Miller has committed crimes with groups of people in the past. I don't know how they picked out Houston. They're not from here. It's just an interesting question if somebody else could have been involved in this crime or at least in the planning of it. And it's one we'll never really be able to solve. Miller also testified about his difficult life during his parents' marriage breaking up. Uh, he testified to being in foster homes, his early beginnings in crime. During the testimony, Miller said, quote, I don't suppose I'm fit for society. I don't feel that I'm totally without some good. According to the Meso B, he said that if given life in prison, he would do his best to make something of his life, including helping young convicts reform. So really, he is making a last ditch plead, given how everything is for his life. Yeah. Unfortunately, this jury is unable to come to an agreed decision on whether Miller deserves a death penalty or a life in prison. After serving for several weeks, this jury is let go and a new one is brought in and the penalty phase is held all over. This new jury determines that Miller should receive the death penalty. After a bank robbery, a murder, a violent shootout, and a trial, it would appear a measure of justice was gained in Stanislaus County. But unfortunately, on appeals, lots of things would change. In 1973, the 5th District Court of Appeals would determine that Miller did not receive a fair trial because he had inadequate representation, and specifically, that representation did not fight for the trial to be moved to another venue adequately. The opinion stated that the trial should have been moved because of the intense and prejudicial press coverage, also in part because Stanislaus County is fairly small and would have been difficult not to have been swayed by that coverage and the coverage of the death of Sheriff Billy Joe Dickens. I'll put up some pictures of the headlines of the crime so you can get a better idea of what that coverage looked like. I will say it included pictures of Dickens' family, uh, things like caskets, a huge spread of the funeral, and while those are pretty commonplace, I think, in 2021, the Modesto B did receive letters at the time to the editor from people who felt that the coverage was too intrusive and went too far, from people who didn't think it was appropriate to even show a casket in the newspaper. So I think we're talking about also a very different time because I don't think people would feel that way now. No, oh, I think now, I mean, we've talked a lot about it too over, over the course of all of our episodes, but it always comes back to that 24-hour 24 24 hour news cycle and the, the entertainmentizing of news where people expect, unfortunately, I think the gory details and the lurid photos. And it, it's weird to think of that even only in 1970 that there was a different time where people would get upset about seeing a casket on, on, on a newspaper. After three years, a new trial was ordered. Not only is this a huge deal because it affects the victims, it affects Miller, but it's also really costly and it's part of a series of cases which had, had similar rulings and those all happened in Stanislaus County at the time. A new trial was had, this time in Fresno, California. Like the first, there was a lot of evidence that Miller had committed this crime and he was found guilty. But one of the biggest things that had changed in California happened in 1972, when the California Supreme Court held that the death penalty, as it was currently being applied in California, was unconstitutional. In 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court would say the same thing. In 1977, California would go back and fix the issues the court had deemed problematic for the use of the death penalty and would once again be able to use it as a penalty. But at this time when a new trial is ordered, the death penalty becomes off the table. And, and so we know that we are talking about the California Supreme Court found that it was unconstitutional according to the California Constitution. They weren't dealing with, an, with a federal constitutional statute. Yeah. But it's under, they're both found for the same reason that in California, we aren't using mitigating circumstances. There was one allowed in a courtroom to discuss whether or not someone receives a death penalty. So similar to what we were talking about in the juvenile justice case. And when this, when they decide that the death penalty under the, the current law is unconstitutional, it's a huge deal. And lots of people um, have to be resentenced. So some of uh, like Charles Manson, or not Charles Manson specifically, but some of his followers who have been sentenced to death. They get resentenced to life imprisonment. Other murderers, uh, one near here where we lived, who was a terrible murderer, just some people just got out. He got out. Uh, some people, so they were just let out. There wasn't really like a plan for what to do next. And because they're going to have this new trial for Miller, while the death penalty is you know not being used, it can't be part of his trial. It can't be a, a punishment. 
what he received in the first trial cannot go on here. So that overturning of his conviction is a huge deal in this case. For Miller, this meant that he was in the second trial in Fresno. He's found guilty, but he receives a punishment of life in prison with the possibility of parole. Throughout his life, Miller would have many parole hearings. Each time he would receive a denial because he wasn't doing what was required to leave prison. His parole hearings would span a time when the loved ones of victims had no place or right to know parole hearings were even happening, much less come forward and speak at them. Later, parole hearings would happen after the Victims' Rights Bill in the 1980s, and as such, victims of Miller's crimes, including members of the Dickens family, were allowed to address the parole board. In interviews of police and prosecutors during Miller's life, he would often be described as a cold-blooded killer who never took responsibility for his actions. Many described him as the most dangerous kind of criminal who felt nothing for anyone. A parole hearing held in 1990 really demonstrates a lot of the characterizations of Miller. During that hearing, he argued with members of the parole board and had many outbursts. At this time, he was at Soledad Prison and was denied parole based on the seriousness of the crimes he had committed, his failure to work towards bettering himself, including participating in educational or work programs, and his continued criminality while in prison. He also hadn't completed any rehabilitation programs. That parole hearing was attended by one of Dickens' daughters. And even she had to suffer the wrath of Miller, who claimed she should, quote, get over her hate for him and focus it on Moore, the other sheriff deputy at the robbery, because he was to blame for her father's murder. In his own defense, Miller said he had gotten over his hatred of police during his time in jail, but not his hatred of dishonest prosecutors. He also said, quote, I'm sorry I killed the man, but I'm not sorry he's under the ground and I'm standing up. He claimed he was too old to hurt anyone further and should be released from jail. You say that. You say. I killed a man, but I'm not sorry he's underground and I'm standing up, and then says, I'm too old, just release me. I mean, this is the, the going to the term possibility. He's not getting out. Like, his oh, actions. Yeah. No, this no, is no, where no. possibility comes in. But to that point, you're, you're still forcing, and I guess you're not forcing because the, the, the family always has an option or, or witnesses don't have to show up. But every time, for example, his daughters have to show up to make sure that that, 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 that possibility isn't actually used. And, and I think that continuing to have, and, and again, this family's never going to lose that. You're never going to get over the, the, a death like that. But then to be forced to sit in a room with a person that took your father's life and to hear like hatred spew from him like that, is it worth it just or, or just to put him in a cage and throw away the key? They, the, that person is not going to be rehabilitated. It doesn't seem to me. Leonard Ellsworth Miller spent the rest of his life in jail. In 1981, he had bypass surgery, but other than that, it seems he had a pretty healthy life. In 1999, he was transferred to Avenal Prison where he died at the age of 75 in 2010. It's a weird thing researching and writing our episodes. We always have the goal of focusing on the victims of the crimes, but so often their deaths, their kidnappings, their trauma is the beginning of lots of legal questions and the journey of, at the very least, holding someone responsible and maybe protecting others. Victims somehow get lost in the midst of those details. But to be sure, there were many victims of this crime. What started as a bank robbery would end with one murder, another death, and two of the most difficult types of wounds to quantify, lasting trauma and grief. The victims of the bank robbery suffered an intense experience that no doubt had lasting complications on their psyche. The bruising from the ties that binded them during the robbery would heal, but the fear and trauma they experienced in the bank, the threat to their life, their loss of freedom, were no less real, but much harder to see wounds. They weren't the only ones. In a 1995 article in the Modesto Bee, Billy Joe Dickinson's partner, Charles Moore, spoke at length about his experience that day and the cost to his life it caused. For him, it was a time when police were expected to go back to work and not think or talk about the trauma that being in a shootout and seeing your friend and coworker die created. Trauma we now know is varied, but inevitable. In fact, the very next day after the robbery, Moore was back at work and hunting down the very murderers he had watched take a life and who had attempted to take his. Despite this being an incredible crime with a lot of fallout, it was very common for the police themselves to never discuss it, even among each other. Moore described the difficulty never speaking of this crime had. One of the officers who looked into his file years later would note that the Houston crime wasn't even mentioned 
Moore suffered nightmares, persistent second-guessing about all the things he could have done different, and would, like a lot of victims of severe trauma, return to the scene of the crime. In essence, this event haunted him. He eventually left policing and the area. In 1995, he was given a Medal of Honor. From all accounts, Sheriff Deputy Billy Joe Dickens was the kind of officer good people try to be like. His work was cut short, as was his life with his wife and three daughters. To even begin to describe that sort of loss for him or for his loved ones would be folly. His murder, like all of the ones we've covered, has implications that last among loved ones forever. No time in jail can fix that or change it. Like other officers killed in the line of duty, Sheriff Dickens is honored at the National Peace Officer Memorial in Washington, D.C., and the California State Police Officer Memorial in Sacramento, California. Money was raised in his honor to supply scholarships for deserving students who wanted to follow in his footsteps. And in Houston, California, the community named a high school in his honor. This school serves as an alternative school for students in their junior and senior year who for one reason or another need to catch up on schoolwork or require an alternative setting. A fitting tribute to a man who gave his life in the service of the Houston community. Meow.